When we added MDMA, what will you do? Went up to 61%. Uh, hell yes. But I saw a bird that morning. You made the first blue in 200 years. I took this photo a couple of summers ago in a place called Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic. And I've got to say, I was pretty stoked to get a shot of this iconic white animal of the far north that not many people ever have the chance to see. Check it out. <laughs> An ivory gull. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit of a bird nerd, but stick with me here, because the ivory gull is way more rare than, say, a polar bear. Here's a better photo of one. This is a ghostly, unpredictable, nomadic bird of the Arctic. Quite beautiful, I think, if you look closely. It's got a rainbow-colored beak. Here's the thing. If you go out looking for a polar bear, you'll probably see a polar bear. They're big and obvious. But if you go looking for birds, maybe you'll be lucky enough to find an ivory gull. And you'll see the polar bear along the way. <laughs> That's what I like about watching birds. They make you see things that you might otherwise miss. How many people saw this movie, The Big Year, when it came out? Yeah, a few of you. Jack Black, Owen Wilson, Steve Martin playing bird watchers. This was actually based on a true story of three gentlemen who went around North America, mostly the US, in 1998, trying to outdo each other by seeing as many species of birds as humanly possible in one calendar year. This concept of a big year has been around for several decades, actually, in the birdwatching scene, and they've happened on any number of scales, from your backyard all the way up to a whole continent, if you're that crazy, like these guys in the movie. But the thing about birds, of course, is that they are all around us. They're one of the most universal creatures in the world, Birds don't need visas and passports and all the rest to travel. They don't see our borders at all. And so, if you wanted to do the ultimate big year of bird watching, you have to take on the whole planet. There are, at last count, something like 10,365 species of birds on planet Earth. And, until 2015, nobody had ever even tried to see half of them, 5,000, in one year. I'd been dreaming about doing something like this ever since probably I was, say, 11 years old. I got inspired by a teacher when I was in fifth grade who put a bird feeder on our classroom window that suction cupped right up to the glass. She'd stop class every time a new bird showed up. Thanks to that teacher, these days when I fill out immigration forms visiting new countries under the space for occupation, I tend to just write bird man. <laughs> It's become a full-time career. And in 2015, things suddenly fell together. I proposed to write a book about birding around the world. A publisher, Houghton Mifflin, said, yep, in fact, we'll give you an advance up front that'll cover the trip. And all of a sudden, the biggest year in the world was on. I remember when I told a friend of mine I was going to try to spot 5,000 birds. He kind of paused for a minute, and then he raised his eyebrows, and he said, hey, man, if you get to 5,000, you should totally get a tattoo of the 5,000th bird, whatever it is, somewhere on your body. I said, I don't even know if this mission is possible yet. I think I have other things to worry about first when I'm planning this, <laughs> like, say, the logistics of putting together such a trip. This would be a 365-day, one-way, continuous, round-the-world journey covering all seven continents with no days off. Figuring out a route strategically, figuring out what to pack. This was pretty much everything I took for a year of traveling the world in one carry-on backpack. And doing my homework, this is just some of the field guides covering the countries that I planned to visit along the way. Took months and months of preparation. But the strategy was simple. Rather than doing this alone, I reached out and connected with this global network of bird watchers in all these different places and essentially called them all up and said, hey, I'm doing a big year. Can I come sleep on your couch for a few days? And do you want to do some bird watching? So this, for instance, is just a group of some of the people who took me out for one morning in northern Borneo when I arrived there. 
This kind of couch surfing approach to traveling wasn't really possible even 10 or 20 years ago in anywhere near the same way, but people are amazingly well connected these days. And bird watching, I don't want to say it's gone mainstream quite yet, but it's undergone a bit of a facelift recently when people like the novelist Jonathan Franzen start writing angsty articles for the New Yorker magazine about their bird watching habit. You know something's up. All I knew was that I was 28 years old, and even though I'd already worked on conservation and research projects with birds for years, I'd still only managed to see a fraction of all the species on this earth. And so, in 2015, I set out to see the world one bird at a time. After kicking things off at the end of the world in Antarctica, things accelerated as I made my way north up into South America. I hit 500 species in late January in Argentina and kept right on going without a break. By mid-February, I was up in Peru and I was on past 1,000. But hold on a second, because I feel like this is kind of how people see bird watching, and especially this type of birding, where you go out somewhere, you find something really interesting, like say a Chilean flamingo in Peru, and you get a really good view of it, maybe you take a photo, maybe not, that's not required, and then at some point, you slap a high five with your friend, and you go, yes, and then you go, check, and that bird becomes a number. And I guess for me, the numbers are the least of all of this project. You can think of birds as a type of currency in some ways, and counting them helps you measure all of these other things, like adventure and inspiration and experiences that are otherwise much more intangible. Things did not always go according to plan. In central Peru, for instance, I met this gentleman, and we spent a couple of weeks together. We had some adventures. We went to the rainforest during the rainy season, and it never stopped raining. I got a case of chiggers on my feet, which was quite itchy. This bus hit a tractor on a highway, and another bus got stuck on a bridge. Took us a couple hours to get around. We had a dead battery in the middle of nowhere and a driving rainstorm on the edge of a cliff. And once we got that sorted out, there were flat tires. A landslide took out the road, and we made it through that one, only to find that another landslide had taken out the rest of the road. At one point, I got stranded on a remote mountaintop in central Peru, stuck in the mud in the ditch with a dead battery and two flat tires simultaneously, and I had to be rescued by an Andean potato farmer named Rolando on the back of his dirt bike who drove me down the mountain. But I saw a bird that morning <laughs> called the golden-backed mountain tanager which is super endemic. Basically, the only place you can find a golden-backed mountain tanager is on this mountaintop, and it is amazing how one bird can brighten up your whole day, <laughs> or even a whole week of misadventures. <laughs> There's no way you can fit the whole world into 12 minutes, but I think for me the most exotic part of this journey had to be Africa. And that's partly because that was the only continent I had not personally visited before this adventure started. Obviously, there's lots of other wildlife out there in Africa, like this leopard I came face to face with in Kruger National Park in South Africa. Once again, when you're looking for birds, you see everything else that's out there along the way as well. But, you know, when people were looking at the African buffalo coming at us, I was more focused on the yellow-billed oxpecker <laughs> clinging to its back. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's true. It's, it's easier to take in a large and overwhelming canvas, like, say, the entire African savanna, by examining it one tiny, subtle detail at a time, instead of looking at the most obvious stuff. So I continued on up through South Africa, Madagascar, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and onward into various parts of Asia. And the sightings racked up. It was in late October in the Philippines that I eventually came across this little bird. It's got red underneath the tail, grayish breast and underbelly, black on the wings. I don't know if you can see, there's a little scarlet on top of the head. It took me a minute to realize the significance of this bird, which was number 5,000. 
with two months left in the year, after 10 months on the road, I had officially made it to my goal. I don't know about my friend's suggestion, though. I, there's only one place for a tattoo of a flame-crowned flower pecker. <laughs> Let's just say I may or may not be man enough. <laughs> At least by this time, I had an answer to a question that I've been wondering about since the beginning. When I first set out on this adventure, my worst fear was that I would get burned out and just hate birding at the end of a whole year of doing absolutely nothing else, which would be terrible, taking the one activity you love the most and then you don't like it anymore. Well, in the end, the opposite happened. And I guess in some ways, you kind of have to treat something like bird watching like a type of addiction. And just imagine giving a drug addict as many hits as he wants for a whole year. It's not going to make it go away. It's just going to mess you up even worse than you were before. And so by the end of this year, when December came around, psychologically speaking, I was a maniacal bird watching machine with no off switch. Officially, the last bird I saw on New Year's Eve at about 11 p.m. on the 31st of December was this nice little owl called an Oriental Bay Owl in India, number 6,042, 60% of all birds on Earth. And then one hour after that, midnight came around, and my year list reset back to zero. By then, I had covered 41 different countries on all seven continents. I flew more than 100,000 miles during this trip. Spent about $60,000, all expenses included. Broke the existing big year world record by 1,700 species. <laughs> and exceeded my own goal by more than 1,000. People said it was like doing a lifetime of bird watching in one year, although I don't really see it that way. I spent exactly one year and I still have the rest of my lifetime ahead to keep on exploring all these places. It was almost like a scouting trip for the rest of my life. <laughs> when I finished up at the end of the year, I could have told you off the top of my head the names of all 6,042 species. I had them all memorized. Now, a couple years later, to be honest, some of the more obscure ones have already started to evaporate. It's kind of hard to keep your Camaropteras and Aeromomelas and Zitting Cysticolas and Oleaginous Hemispinguses straight. <laughs> but I still remember every single one of the people that I met during my travels that year. And there were hundreds by the end. Every single one of the new friendships, connections, characters. These are the memories that really stick with you when you travel, especially when you share such an intense interest like this. The thing about birds, of course, is that they really are universal. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, there's birds around you, and so anyone can become fascinated by them. And that means that we all share the birds of this planet, and by extension, the planet that they inhabit. And maybe that sounds a little touchy-feely, but I think it's worth saying, especially in today's general climate, that birds help remind us how to be global citizens and how connected all of us really are. This big year is only one example of how we accomplish things by working together across all kinds of borders. Just imagine what birds might see if they watched us, <laughs> this kaleidoscope of humans running around with all kinds of crazy ideas and projects with no visible borders dividing us at all. So as we head into a new year now, in 2018, my wish for all of you, no matter what your passion or slight obsession may be, is to keep your eyes on the skies because you never know what you might see when you keep looking up. Thank you.
Thank you.